Good morning, everyone. Welcome. My name is Lynette Marshall, and it's a pleasure to welcome you today. I am the president and CEO of the University of Iowa Center for Advancement, and I'm truly delighted to be your host this morning for this very special presentation on autism research and care and the work that's happening at the University of Iowa. STED Talks is a regular educational offering that gives an inside look at some of the innovative research and care that is being provided at the University of Iowa Stead Family Children's Hospital. And we are delighted to be able to continue this program virtually today. We're so pleased this morning to welcome guests from 20 different states across the US, from Florida to Washington and from Maine to California. I want to also offer a special welcome Welcome to one of our guests who registered from Newcastle upon Tyne in England. We of course also have many, many guests from river to river across Iowa and then coast to coast. As a reminder, we have posted a few Zoom guidelines for you. One thing to note that this event is being live captioned. So if you would like that option, please click the CC icon at the bottom of the screen. And we un understand that in some instances, the Zoom live caption takes a few minutes to catch up with the actual program. So um, be patient if that doesn't immediately show up. If you think of a question during our uh, panelists remarks that you would like to ask, you can use the Q and A button at the bottom of your screen to send a question and we will address those after each of our panelists have spoken. So we'll begin with some very brief introductions. I'm joined by some good friends and remarkable healthcare experts today. Panelists, if you could give a little wave when I call your name, it will help our audience put some names with faces this morning. So thank you, Ted, for waving. Ted Abel is the director of the Iowa Neuroscience Institute and holds the Roy J. Carver Chair in Neuroscience in the Carver College of Medicine. Lane Strathern, if you'd give a wave, Lane, holds the Bell McGinnis Chair for Pediatric Neurodevelopment in the Department of Psychological and Brain Sciences. Diane McBrien, Clinical Professor of Development and Behavioral Pediatrics is in the Stead Family Department of Pediatrics. Hannah Stevens is the Ida P. Haller Chair of the Division of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry in the University of Iowa Department of Psychiatry. And Jake Michelson is a Roy J. Carver Associate Professor of Psychiatry and Neuroscience in the Department of Psychiatry. So thank you to all of you um, who are our guests today and thank you to our panelists for taking time to share your knowledge and insight this morning. We're fortunate at Iowa to have a leading children's hospital with specialists who care for patients with autism. We also have a highly regarded interdisciplinary research center and everyone is working together to advance knowledge and understanding of autism and to provide top-notch clinical care and support for our patients and their families. So our first speaker, is going to be the director of the Iowa Neuroscience Institute, Dr. Ted Abel. Dr. Abel came to the University of Iowa in 2017 to lead this brand new institute. And as you will soon learn, he has a personal connection to today's topic as well. Thank you, Dr. Abel, for being with us today. Thanks, Lynette. And good morning, everyone. Uh, as Lynette said, my name is Ted Abel, and I'm director of the Iowa Neuroscience Institute and also chair of the Department of Neuroscience and Pharmacology in the Carver College of Medicine. In 1999, in December, our son Seamus was born. We had quite a surprise at his birth. He had some challenges at birth and had what's called an intraventricular hemorrhage and was in neonatal intensive care at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia for about two weeks. He was in a room with uh, conjoined twins who had come from Poland to be separated by surgeons uh, at Children's Hospital and with a baby that uh, had no last name and was actually found on the streets of West Philadelphia. It was a dramatic start uh, to a life 
uh, that has, has evolved into a diagnosis with autism at age three and educational challenges as he sought to navigate uh, the world. And at that time in 1999, I was an assistant professor of biology at Penn, studying the molecular mechanisms of memory storage. And over time, seeing Seamus grow up, uh, we've, I've moved my research to study the molecular mechanisms underlying autism and trying to understand that complex disorder that we'll discuss today. It's, it's an incredible story that actually comes to today where uh, downstairs Seamus is getting ready for a German class as a freshman at the University of Iowa. It's been a tremendous journey uh, led largely by my wife who is a phenomenal uh, mother. We have a video that was put together uh, by the Big Ten about my son and our work. And I think we'll start with that and then I'll make a few comments. So if we could go to the Big Ten video, that would be great. My son Seamus is on the autism spectrum. When Seamus was diagnosed, I was able to change my research focus from a focus on memory to a focus on the study of neurodevelopmental disorders like autism. The autism spectrum is a spectrum. It's a spectrum of behaviors, and those behaviors can include exceptional behaviors as well as behaviors that are quite challenging. The mission of the Iowa Neuroscience Institute is to understand psychiatric and neurological diseases like autism. Individuals with autism have trouble knowing what's going to happen next, and that's especially challenging in social and emotional settings. Our most recent breakthrough has been this idea that autism is about prediction, and that's enabled us to identify particular circuits in the brain that are affected by autism. And our hope is that by better understanding how the brain works, we'll be able to develop better treatments. My son Seamus is on the autism spectrum. All right, thanks everyone. I think um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about our work. I just want to first say uh, one thing that's kind of interesting. I actually got a call last weekend. My uncle Bobby in, uh, in Ocean City, Maryland was trying to watch a Big Ten football game to get his mind off of everything. And he was walked away and he heard this voice that he recognized, uh, which was actually me in this video. So it was fun to have a chance to touch base with my uncle. I know we're having a lot of impact in Iowa. I didn't expect it to extend to Ocean City, Maryland and my uncle, which was really, really terrific. Um, so as you've heard, we really have been guided and, and, and driven by trying to understand autism. And on the next slide, you'll see, as we'll hear today, particularly from Diane McBrien next, autism is a complex uh, disorder that is referred to, they're referred to as autism spectrum disorders. It's referred to as a spectrum. And as I noted in, in the video, that spectrum includes challenges. It also includes uh, in exceptionalities. And we see on, on the left-hand side of the slide, the central core autisms of social deficit language impairment and repetitive behaviors. But what we see is a number of things that impact individuals with autism, from seizures to intellectual disability to uh, more medical issues uh, like GI issues and sleep issues and hyperactivity. What's been incredible is the increase in the prevalence of autism now to one in 54 in the latest uh, uh, CDC epidemiological studies. And so things we've been trying to understand is how is it that you can have a disorder so complex? Is it due to the fact that there are many, many autisms or is there maybe an idea, a construct, uh, an aspect of neuroscience that could actually help us understand all all of these different aspects of the autism spectrum. We actually started studying that by studying mice. Uh, my research has been in mice and the behavior of mice. And starting with the genetics, we'll hear from ge about genetic advances uh, from Jake Michelson. And there have been, uh, they've been extensive and revolutionary in our understanding of autism. And so we asked, what is it about mice that have mutations in genes that are linked to autism? Do they have something in common? What was very interesting is we found that the mice had a thing what would happen next. We put them in a test where they would get a reward if they poked their nose in a hole when a light lit. And what we found is that the mice with mutations in these genes linked to autism were unable to learn that association as quickly, unable to predict what would happen. And in the next slide, we see this idea, general idea, 
that maybe if we think about autism as a disorder of prediction, it might help us understand these various diverse aspects and also help us understand uh, potentially better treatment approaches. And so as we navigate the world uh, through development and through life, we learn how to predict what will happen next. And one of the things you can imagine is that if you can't do that, then you're gonna have very, a lot of difficulty with social interactions because there you have to uh, predict very, very quickly what someone is gonna say or do. And if, you're, uh, if you find that challenging, then social interactions are going to be difficult. And in response to that difficulty, an individual may develop uh, these repetitive behaviors or uh, restricted interests that you can predict. So our son Seamus needs uh, schedules and plans for what's gonna happen. And when things don't go according to plan, that's when we have behavioral challenges and uh, we have difficulties uh, and he has difficulties in navigating the world. On the neurobiological level, to get a little more technical, these mechanisms of prediction are mediated by a brain circuit called the corticostriatal circuit, uh, two major parts of the brain, the cortex and the striatum. And you can see in the bottom of this slide some imaging data from a lab at uh, UCLA, where individuals with autism show less activation of the striatum in response to reward. But in typically developing individuals, you see the yellow, which is an activated striatum in response to uh, rewarding stimuli. This circuitry in the striatum doesn't just mediate reward, it mediates prediction. It also mediates language, both the learning of language and the prediction of language. And it mediates motor behaviors, so it could underlie repetitive behaviors seen in autism. And so we hope that this theoretical idea that autism may be a disorder of prediction, that we came to from watching mice and how they behave, may help us better understand the challenges that individuals like Seamus face as they seek uh, to navigate the world. Um, so thank you uh, everyone for joining us uh, today. And uh, I noticed there's already a question in the, the Q&A box. So please feel free to add questions and we'll have the panelists uh, answer them uh, at the end. Our uh, next speaker is Diane uh, McBrien. Uh, Diane McBrien is the medical director of the Center for Disabilities and Development at the University of Iowa Stead Family Children's Hospital. And she's a professor of pediatrics in the Division of Developmental and Behavioral Pediatrics in the Carver College of Medicine. In, the, in her talk, uh, she'll provide insight from her experience overseeing several clinics serving populations of individuals with developmental disorders that include autism. Diane, thank you uh, for joining us today. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ted. Um, well, I thought, uh, good morning, everybody. I thought it would be helpful, uh, given our topic, to define terms a little bit and walk us through a definition of what autism and the autism spectrum is. You know, especially in the last 10 years, uh, autism has an enormous footprint in popular culture and in social media. And uh, so, a lot of us, you know, you can see someone out in public and uh, you can think, you know, I wonder if that person has autism. Um, and autism is portrayed on shows like The Big Bang Theory um, and The Good Son. And uh, so, you know, the media constantly tells us what autism is. Um, but it's important when we're making the diagnosis to adhere to uh, best practice criteria. And uh, the criteria, the diagnostic criteria are um, listed in a, a book called the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual 5. And the reason it's 5 is because this uh, is uh, a manual that is about maybe every 15 years is uh, reviewed um, uh, according to the latest research. Um, it's, it, it's called the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, and uh, it was last updated in 2013. And uh, the Diagnostic Criteria for Autism Spectrum Disorders uh, say that uh, you need to look at two basic areas of uh, diagnostic criteria. And so the first one is something called social communication. 
And we all kind of intuitively know what social communication is. The first thing we think of is speech. But I'm talking really about all the tools that a human being has at their disposal to let other people know what they want, to make requests, to communicate emotion, and to have a conversation. So, and those, start, those tools start showing up very, very early, don't they? Uh, in infancy, with eye contact, with giggles, with uh, smiling back at uh, a parent when they smile at you. Um, so uh, we're looking at speech, and most people know, well, you know, my child with autism was delayed in talking. But we're looking at how you use that speech. Do you say words just to say them, just to say them over and over? Do you echo what other people say? Or do you use your speech to talk to other people? to ask them questions, to have a back and forth conversation, uh, to get to know them. Uh, do you use nonverbal tools of communication? Do you look at other people? Do you use facial expressions? Do you use gestures, other forms of body language? Do you smile when you're happy? Do you use other facial expressions that are congruent to the situation? Do you frown when you're sad? Do you look at other people and share your facial expressions with them? Do you point to things uh, and look at other people to let you, them know what you want? Um, social reciprocity uh, is another area where we look at. And social reciprocity is just how good are you at drawing another person into your circle and cooperating with them? An example of social reciprocity in childhood is, are you able to take turns in a game? Are you able to play with another child, not just alongside of them? So persistent deficits in, can, can we go back for a little bit? Thanks, no, back, back to, thank you, thank you so much. Um, social reciprocity. And the second main area is restricted and repetitive patterns of behavior, interests, and activities. Uh, manifested by at least two specific examples. So uh, I think some of, some of us may be familiar with these kind of uh, patterns of behavior. Um, I'm talking about uh, stereotyped or repetitive movements. These are things like hand flapping, body rocking, uh, spinning, um, or fix, fixed and restrictive interests. Um, you know, I'm going to show you a video coming up here where a child plays with toys inappropriately. And one of the things we do in clinic is we get down and we play with the children and we provide a lot of symbolic toys. And if you think about the way you played with toys as a child, uh, you were, some of what you were doing was you were imitating what the grown-ups did. Maybe you had a toy kitchen and you looked at your parents cooking the soup and you cook the soup, or you, you talked on a toy phone, or you had a toy farm and you brought the uh, animals into the toy barn. Um, that was your ability to imitate. What we're looking for when we evaluate a child for autism is can they do that? And if they don't do that, uh, that is worrisome. That is something called restrictive interest. If they use the toy abnormally, if they just want to line up and sort the toy, if they want to play with a part of the toy, that raises our concern a little bit. Uh, the third uh, example of uh, a restricted or repetitive ex pattern of behavior or interests or activities is hyper or hypo re reactivity to sensory input. So these are things to, um, these are very severe, severe symptoms to count. Uh, for example, children who are very, very scared, this is just an example of loud noises, just cannot bear being out in public because of loud noises. Um, very, very restricted diet, for example, uh, maybe can tolerate only a couple of kinds of food. Um, in other words, they have very, very strong preferences as far as what they feel, what they taste, and what they hear. Uh, all these symptoms must be present early on. They must limit everyday life. 
and they're not explained by the child having a significant intellectual disability. Uh, next slide, please. Now, I'm going to show you uh, a slide of a very typical toddler to show you uh, uh, what I mean by normal social communication and symbolic play. Now, to show you what I'm looking for when I want to reassure parents when autism is ruled out, this child has very good eye contact. This child uses a toy very typically to imitate. And this child has nice eye contact. Uh, looks up at the adult and has nice back and forth. So play, play video, please. Let's make some ice cream, stir. Stir it up. Ooh, it's delicious. It's so good. Mmm, that's good. I'm going to get some more. I want some chocolate. Ooh, delicious. It's chocolate. Lots of chocolate. Put some in too. You want some more chocolate? See how they're super cold that is? Here, here's your ice cream cone. <laughs> Delicious. Here. Okay, she had good eye contact. Leave her ice cream. Yeah, guys. Does that mean strawberry? Strawberry slice Oh, it's strawberry cookie chocolate. Okay, I know, I know it's time. I just wanted, uh, I want, um, Mackenzie, I just want them to see this next uh, video and then, Let's we, make some ice then we can skip the rest of the slide. I want you to just see uh, this in contrast to that video. I want you to see uh, that this is a child on the spectrum, uh, just a couple months older than that, this last child. This child has normal hearing and there's all kinds of attempts to engage him. He's not answering. Uh, to his name, and he's not playing with toys correctly. You want to try to see if you can get him to respond to it? No. Evan. 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 See maybe if you can get him to respond to you now you can use touch with his name, like give him a little tickle or something. Evan. 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 He likes the tickles, but he's just not giving you too much eye contact, but he does smile when you okay. tickle him. Evan. Evan. Okay, he's just mouthing the toys. Uh, she was not able to engage him at all in any back and forth or social reciprocity. Uh, he could not be engaged in any back and forth play. He was not deliberately ignoring her or deaf, and that's what a lot of parents initially think, but I wanted you to see the contrast between that toddler and the earlier one. Um, Evan. Uh, Mackenzie, it's time. We can skip these last slides. That was the most important thing I want them to um, see. Um, I'd like to um, present uh, Dr. Jake Michelson, uh, who's the Associate Pro Professor of Psychiatry and Neuroscience and the Division Director of Computational and Molecular Psychiatry at the University of Iowa. He is the Iowa Site Principal Investigator for SPARC, which is the landmark autism research project and the largest genetic study of autism ever. Dr. Michelson? Thank you, Diane. Um, I'd just like to start with this image here of uh, a selection of individuals with autism. And the reason I want to show this is because I want to emphasize um, the huge amount of diversity that is found within autism. There's an old, uh, it's almost a cliche saying that you hear uh, from many physicians that work with children with autism, that once you've seen one kid with autism, you've seen one kid with autism. And that's a statement that underscores that uh, there's not just one autism spectrum, but there are actually many intersecting spectra um, that uh, the act along a continuum, and there's a there's a space that individuals with autism occupy, and there are different parts of that space that they occupy. Um, and so, to be able to get a handle on this, um, we needed to be able to uh, sample a huge number of individuals with autism. Uh, next slide. Um, and so SPARC uh, is, is a nationwide study. We've partnered with 30 other, over 30 other uh, academic medical centers around the country 
to recruit 50,000 individuals with autism and their families. And so that's more uh, people than, than can fit into uh, Wrigley Field. And so as Diane said, this is the largest genetic study of autism ever. And it's unique for a couple of other reasons that I'll mention in, in just a bit. But if you want to learn more about Spark, uh, or even if you'd like to sign up for Spark, you can visit this website uh, to find out more. Next slide. So Spark is a revolution in terms of uh, participant engagement and in ease of enrollment. So you can enroll completely within the comfort of your own home, although we do spend a lot of time uh, helping families through the process, especially uh, if they have children who are unable to spit into a tube, which is what you see happening here. That's how uh, DNA is collected. There's no blood draw necessary. And that DNA is sent off to a lab uh, where, where it's sequenced. Um, and then participants have an online dashboard where they can see if they have a genetic result that's returned, they can see that genetic result. Um, they can learn about further research opportunities uh, provided by scientists like us. And so it's really that step four that I wanna emphasize. Uh, next slide. So these points uh, represent uh, Spark, where Spark participants are distributed around the country. And um, as you can see, uh, just from the sheer numbers, Spark represents a research resource and community of epic proportions uh, with nearly actually over 200,000 participants who are ready to help scientists like us uh, make new discoveries about autism and about the brain. Next slide. Uh, now, one of the major goals of SPARC is to be able to make a, a map of autism that scientists and doctors can use to better understand it. Um, and so my lab used uh, some data that was collected in SPARC about the core symptoms of autism to find the symptom patterns that seem to show up again and again. And so our analysis um, suggested that SPARC participants can be described as combinations of seven fundamental kinds, or, or you can think of them as flavors of, of autism. Um, and so you can think of this on the right as a map of autism, and, and each colorful point on this map represents a single individual with autism who's participating in SPARC. And so uh, you can see some of the, the major kinds that, uh, that we've discovered there on the uh, figure on the right. Next slide. And I realize we've got audience participants from uh, around the country and around the world, which is fantastic. But I wanted to emphasize here uh, that Iowans uh, with autism are making vital contributions to autism research. We've recruited over 5,000 um, Iowans into SPARC since we joined in 2017. And our goal is to give every Iowan affected by autism the opportunity to participate in SPARC. And so uh, go to the next. Uh, Okay, so Kate, uh, Kate and Sydney are our current project coordinators and we work closely with today's panelists uh, and other clinicians to provide research opportunities that are integrated with clinical care. So uh, I wanted to say a little bit about genetic research because that's what we do. Um, and so it's important to think about the why and, and uh, if we go to the next slide, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. So, here I'm showing um, what's called a karyotype, and these are the, the chromosomes that we all have. And um, there's been a lot of research over the past couple of decades and that has sort of reached a crescendo now um, that has firmly established that autism is profoundly genetic. Um, in fact, a study from last year of millions of people uh, put that number at about 84% genetic, which is quite striking when you consider the other uh, very common conditions, things like cancer and heart failure, are in the neighborhood of 20 to 40 percent genetic, and those are things that we all understand have genetic risk factors. And in comparison, autism is 84 percent genetic. Now, the challenge is, even though we know that it's genetic, uh, knowing what genes are involved in autism is an entirely different matter. And so that is where work is concentrated right now from uh, labs like mine and others. And we estimate that there may be up to a thousand genes um, that in various combinations uh, uh, push a, a person in one direction or another within this autism space. So the different ways that autism can manifest. So the combination of kinds of genes you have play a big role in um, whether or not you have autism and what kind of autism you might have. So next slide. Now understanding the genetic basis of autism um, can lead to a lot of important insights. So we can use these uh, genetic relationships to, to understand 
how autism relates to other uh, traits and conditions that we know about, things like uh, ADHD, which is very uh, commonly comorbid with autism. A very unexpected discovery, and that was very interesting, and that scientists are still trying to unpack, is that autism and educational attainment, or the number of years of education that you pursue, those share a common genetic basis, and they're positively correlated. And so we're trying to understand things like that. Um, we can use genetic research and understanding of the genetic basis to devise more targeted treatments. Because if you think back to that slide that I showed at the very beginning, people are very different and people with autism are very different. And so what works for one individual with autism, there's no guarantee that it will work for another individual with autism. And so the idea is to devise more targeted treatments, things that can improve quality of life that are tailored to individual biology and individual circumstance. We can appreciate unexpected strengths. One of the things that we're looking at right now is uh, twice exceptionality, where individuals with an autism diagnosis are, are also high academic achievers, but they have a certain constellation of challenges that um, other individuals with autism might not have. Um, we can use it to, uh, to better understand the brain in general. Um, a lot of autism research sort of covertly funds um, uh, neuroscience research in general that helps us just better understand how the human brain works and likewise to understand um, it, uh, mechanisms behind human evolution because a lot of the things that lead to mutations that uh, that confer risk for autism um, they they happen disproportionately in genes that um, that are unique to humans and and so that uh, is, uh, autism is one manifestation of this idea that humans are continuing to, um, to undergo these evolutionary processes, which is very fascinating. Uh, so yeah, the, my final slide here uh, is, I just wanted to, to give an idea of the kinds of questions that we're investigating in partnership with the Spark community. So why do individuals with autism tend to have uh, so many more sleep problems than those who don't? Why, what about the eating problems that were highlighted before? Why more boys than girls? Why are boys more likely to be diagnosed than girls? Um, also the connections between um, risk for autism and how that affects language. And I mentioned giftedness in autism. And we're also looking at gender variance, which um, I think there was a, uh, we'll see if, if we get to talk about that later. But that's where I'm gonna end right now and we'll see what questions come up that um, I might be able to field. I'd like to introduce my uh, good colleague, uh, Dr. Lane Strathern, who um, is uh, the uh, Division Director for Developmental and Behavioral Pediatrics. And uh, so I talked about the genetic factors that are associated with autism. And one of the really cool things and the, the cool research that Lane does is that he tries to better understand uh, some of the environmental factors that, uh, that, can, that can tune some of those other uh, innate risks and, and um, help determine different kinds of outcomes. Um, and so epigenetics being a phenomenon that he's uh, very interested in his research. And so Lane, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Okay, thanks very much, Jake. So autism is a neurodevelopmental disorder, meaning that it, it evolves over the early stages of uh, childhood. So in fact, we don't actually, um, we're not actually able to diagnose autism until maybe around two to four years of age. Most commonly children aren't diagnosed until four or five years of age, which means that something is happening during that early phase of development and potentially even during pregnancy that's um, leading to some of these, these important deficits in social communication and some of these very atypical patterns of behavior that Diane described with the repetitive and the restricted interests that children with autism manifest. So one thing about uh, my life as a developmental pediatrician is I've, I've just loved learning about how the brain develops in these early phases of, of childhood. And it, it just never ceases to amaze me when I learn more about um, how intricate and how um, expansive this developmental process actually is. So this cute baby is actually my grandson. And as you can see, there are a lot of things that happen over the first few years of life in terms of physical development, but even more incredulous, in, incredibly, is the changes that occur 
in terms of a child's actual development. When you think about a newborn baby, you know, they are completely dependent on us for survival. A baby can't survive without our, our help. And yet over those first few years, they develop incredible capacities. You know, my, my grandson is now a first grader and he tells me what to do and he tells me all about what I should be doing and how life should be, okay, in a very sophisticated way. It's, it's really amazing. But you think about that first year of life when an infant learns to walk, learns how to communicate, learns to say words in response to their environment um, and, and is able to use their, their hands to manipulate things, to draw, to eventually write. All of these things are happening in those very early stages of development. And relevant to autism, social development is also occurring uh, during that, that phase. So um, we know that brain size increases, it, it doubles over the first year of life. And what we call synaptic density, it, which is how closely packed the brain cells are within the brain, um, quadruples over the first year of life. So there are a lot of things that are happening, many of which are guided by genetic processes like Jake talked about, but we also know that these developmental processes are also crucially guided by experience, by early developmental experience. So the stimulation that an infant gets in terms of language exposure, in terms of touch, in terms of visual experience, all of those things shape the brain in specific ways that help determine who we are as as a social being. And so that's, that's really incredible. And over the last decade or two, we have actually learned more about the mechanisms by which social experience maps on to social development. And this is what we call epigenetics, which is how uh, environmental experiences actually change in physical ways how genes are able to function, how they're expressed in the brain, whether they're turned on or off, whether they're up or down regulated in response to the, the actual environment in which those cells uh, operate. When we think about autism and the numbers of children who are being diagnosed with autism, particularly if we look back over the last 20 years, we can see very clearly there, that there has been a dramatic rise in the number of children who are being uh, diagnosed with autism. And when you compare that with, say, intellectual disability, which has remained at that time, we, it, it's very clear in this study and in several other studies that there, are, um, there has been a dramatic rise in the prevalence. Next slide. You can see here on this, this study that has used basically the same mechanisms, the same questions uh, to, de to determine ch the numbers of children throughout the United States who are diagnosed with autism. And uh, when we, we, we just got a, a recent update in that for data from 2016 and another jump uh, increase in prevalence. So a big question is, well, why? Why is this the case? And um, could it be that uh, our social experience and social environment may be contributing to the increased numbers of autism? So our lab, the Attachment and Neurodevelopment Lab here at uh, the University of Iowa, has been focused more, more recently on trying to develop tools that will help us to better understand the early social environment that children are exposed to and how that may predict some of the, the symptoms of autism. So we've actually developed a, a research smartphone app that's called Baby Steps. And this app allows us to collect data from large numbers of individuals from throughout Iowa and throughout the rest of the country. And we even have collaborations in the United Kingdom and China to even get a broader spectrum of information from families, 
uh, and children who are ultimately diagnosed with autism, we collect what's called ecological momentary assessments, where parents are able to report moment by moment, day by day, on symptoms of anxiety or stress or depression. We're able to record developmental milestones as they occur in real time. We're able to videotape social behavior. We, we use this app to do what every single parent already does, and that's videotape their baby, so that we had this ongoing record of infant social development over the first couple of years of life. And then we've tried to incorporate uh, features in the app that uh, pay back the families for their involvement in the study, a virtual baby book, and that morph video that I showed at the start of the talk will pre uh, prepare one of those videos for every participant in the study as a thank you for their contribution. So the goal is that we can look at, back slide, sorry, uh, we can look at some of the factors that may be interacting with genetic vulnerability to help predict those children who go on to develop autism and the type of features that those uh, children develop over time. And secondly, we, uh, uh, our goal is to see how the epigenetic changes measured in the blood correlate with those changes or differences in social environment. So that's where we're headed. And uh, I'm excited to be able to tell you more about that. Please contact me if you're interested in, in learning more. Thank you. So I'm very excited to uh, be able to introduce my colleague and friend, Hannah Stevens, who is actually a child psychiatrist here at the University of Iowa and the division director for child psychiatry. Uh, she holds a chair in the Division of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry and is head of a research lab called Psychiatry and Early Development Lab at the Carver College of Medicine. She's also an associate editor at the Journal of Autism and Developmental Disorders. So I hand it over to you, Hannah. Thanks so much, Lane. Um, so today I want to generally uh, tell you about the clinical care for individuals with autism, which can be very complex and it has to really address many different issues and tap into the knowledge of many different experts. I want to highlight for you um, how one of our departments here at University of Iowa, the Department of Psychiatry, provides clinical care for individuals with autism. And there's three major points that I hope you will take away from what I'm going to tell you today. The first is that having autism can affect a person throughout their lifetime. So clinical care really has to address problems for both children and adults. With our lifespan approach that we take at University of Iowa, we take this really seriously. And a person with autism is more likely to have other problems that can be treated very effectively when the right approach is taken to that problem, as you've heard from a number of the speakers already today. At University of Iowa, we have experts with many different backgrounds who can address these, all the while keeping the vulnerabilities of autism in mind. And then third, each person with autism is unique, and caring for them means making a person and a family connection. And I can assure you that the wonderful people that I'm going to tell you about today from the University of Iowa uh, do just that. So some of the examples of things that can happen to a person with autism, starting from the youngest age, first click, are, you know, severe tantrums, uh, impulsivity, and we have some amazing people from our young child team, Dr. Kelly Pelzel, a child psychologist, and Dr. Burgundy Johnson, who can address these problems that young children with autism can have. Next click. When children get older, um, other problems become more prevalent and problems like conflicts with parents, medical problems that come along with having autism can also be addressed by some of our amazing team members like Dr. Michael Lind, a child psychologist that works behaviorally with parents, and Dr. Pixie Plummer, who's both a pediatrician and an internist who has specialized in working with people with developmental disabilities. Next click. When people become young adults, of course, different problems present entirely, and they can really be greatly helped by other members of our team. Physical fights that can happen as individuals get older and their brain changes and their physical activity changes can be helped by Dr. Kelly Vinquist, an adult psychologist, who really has great interventions for reducing these kinds of problems. Susanna Strode can also provide help for that struggle that many families have with the growing independence of an individual with autism, where they want to support them in their community to become more their own person. Next click. 
And then when they become older young adults, uh, we may need to provide them supports that many people need, uh, not just people with autism, but the need for help with their job, which can be provided by our community outreach specialist, Mark Hines, or the other kinds of problems that occur with adulthood commonly in people, that's mood disorders, and depression can be really well addressed. And one of our specialists, Dr. Alan Anderson, as a psychiatrist, can really help with that kind of problem. And then next click, when you get to be an older adult, some of the same problems can come back around again that really happened earlier in a person's life, like the attention problems that were treated as a young child, which can be treated by Kara Whalen there in the bottom, uh, who's our physician assistant on the team, or by Pixie Plummer again, addressing medical problems that can evolve as a person ages. The wonderful thing about this team is they not only reach people from younger to older ages, but they bring this really important range of perspectives to that care and they ensure that individuals can really access the assessment and the treatment that's best for them. Okay, Hannah, thank you very much. We are delighted to um, have heard from each of you and we appreciate those comments. I've learned several things myself. Um, we do have several questions that have been asked, and I'd like to start the first question for Diane, and that's about whether a child who has autism is able to thrive in a normal school setting. Um, Lynette, that's, a, that's an excellent question, um, and uh, the answer is um, absolutely. You know, that is uh, absolutely, that can be the case. Uh, that doesn't mean that it um, can't happen without significant supports. Um, as you've all heard over and over um, throughout this talk, um, autism is a spectrum. And there are some students uh, with autism spectrum disorder that may not need uh, significant support um, during their school careers and others that need very significant supports throughout their school careers. Um, one of the main points uh, in the answer to this question is that uh, children with autism have a federal right to attend uh, public school and they have a federally guaranteed right to what is called in the law a free appropriate public education. And uh, so that is, that is guaranteed. Um, they um, are, uh, it, so once that, that autism is diagnosed, then uh, the school will go about assessing their needs. Now, best practice these days is that a child with any kind of special need, not just autism, is included as much as possible with their peers. And that's good for all kinds of reasons. That's good for typical peers. Uh, that's good for the child with the special need. It's good for everybody. Everybody learns. Um, so the short answer is yes. Um, it's federally guaranteed, it's guaranteed at the state level, um, but it needs, it takes a village. It takes a village. If I can just follow up on Diane's answer with my personal experience, um, it almost makes me cry. One of the most moving experiences I've had in the state of Iowa is having a chance to hug Senator Tom Harkin, whose work on the ADA and IDEA acts enabled education for individuals with special needs like my son, Seamus. And as I told Senator Harkin, he's personally responsible for our son's education. That comes from his experience with his brother, Frank, uh, who's deaf. And uh, Senator Harkin used that experience in the Senate to make a difference uh, for kids with autism. And that came from the state of Iowa, a huge impact. It's a reminder of the importance of policy and the, the work that can be done there. Diane? I'd like to underscore, yes, Senator Harkin has absolutely been a, a, a massive uh, influence in this state. It's, it's very, the range of help uh, that a uh, child with autism needs may be very individualized. Some children may need uh, a lot of accommodations, say, for their attention span. 
um, or for, um, say, uh, writing expression. Uh, some children may need accommodation for uh, sensory integration, uh, things like sensory breaks, uh, sitting on an exercise ball, swinging, um, uh, things like that. So it's very, very individualized and um, you need uh, a teacher and a family who every so often, you know, gets together and assesses the child's needs and says, okay, what, where are we now? Yeah, thank you, Diane. Okay. Anna, um, a question for you. What about the um, part of autism that isn't caused 84% by genetics? Um, we have some questions from our guests about the environmental impacts on the health of the mother and then um, another um, attendee today has inquired about the connection with vaccines. Can you address some of those um, as well? Yeah, I'd be happy to. I do think there was a great answer provided to the vaccine uh, question in the chat. I don't know if everybody can see that, but there have been a lot of extensive studies uh, trying to examine whether there is a link, and it's been found that they're really uh, you know, we haven't found a link between vaccines. However, still people wonder what is the risk that's coming from non-genetic sources. And I think that uh, Lane Strathern really addressed the fact that there's likely interacting factors in the environment. His study is trying to look at social development and whether there's things that impact that and the neuro neurobiology that underlies that. And I would also say that people are investigating a number of other um, factors, including, um, you know, more mild, more um, subtle impacts of changes to um, uh, prenatal brain development uh, that may occur because there's uh, changes in the physiology during pregnancy uh, that we don't yet understand. Uh, one person asked about um, environmental chemicals. I think there are studies out there trying to investigate whether there are links. We haven't found really big smoking guns, uh, so to speak, uh, between environmental links. They all seem to have sort of um, some uh, small amount of risk that increases a risk, uh, but not like having a single gene that we know causes or a single risk factor that we know causes uh, things. And uh, I think the, the real um, benefit is that we are so far advanced in our understanding of genetics that we can understand how those things interact. Um, because I think there's always gonna be that combination of factors. There's never gonna be one thing, I made a mistake and I, and I used some pesticide around my child and that caused autism. I don't think it's like that kind of connection. Um, it's gonna be a much more subtle increasing risk from multiple different sources. Good, thank you very much. Um, Lane, we have a question for you uh, from someone who says, our son seemed to be developing normally until he was about two years old and then things abruptly changed. And we understand this is typical and why might that be? Right, that's a great question. And that is something that we do commonly hear from families who present in clinic, that everything seemed to be progressing normally with their child's development. And then at a certain point in time, things, things seem to regress. So the child may have, have lost skills that they once had or just plateaued in their development. So instead of increasing with their developmental skills, things seem to plateau. So that's an important question that a lot of people are trying to better understand, but we don't have a, a full grasp of why that is the case. Uh, we know that there are certain um, milestones in development that become evident at certain stages. So, um, you know, language starts presenting at a year of age when, when children start saying their first words, mama, dada. But we know that the acquisition of the language capacity begins very, very early on, even from birth. Infant, even prenatally, we know that, that infants are hearing sounds within the womb that is helping to shape uh, language development. So it may just be that these developmental skills are developing over time as a result of genetic factors and potentially environmental factors, but they're not actually manifesting until you know, the second year of life or beyond, which is when the diagnosis is made. 
Good. Thank you very much, Lane. And the last question that we are um, going to uh, ask today will be for Jake. And that is, if one of the parents is autistic, is that making it more likely than their child might be um, experiencing autism as well? Um, well, I guess the short answer is it, it, it does. Um, so the, the familial risk, uh, if there's a person in the family who already has an autism diagnosis, um, that family is at about a, approximately tenfold um, increase risk uh, to have another individual in that family also have autism. And so the current, and so tenfold means 10 times the, the, the average rate over the population, which is about one and a half to 2%. So there's about probably about a 15 to 20% um, chance that uh, a child would also be diagnosed with autism. Good, thank you very much. Um, we are to the end of our time and I'm confident that our uh, attendees have each enjoyed and learned as much as I have. And I'd like to thank our panelists for making time this morning um, for, and for the work that they do on behalf of our patients and their families and the important research that they conduct. Thank you to all of you for joining us this morning. If you have other questions and or if you would like to be included in future STED talks, please let us know via the email or the telephone numbers that are on your screen right now, and we'd be pleased to connect with you. It's always a joy to be able to share the good work that happens at the University of Iowa, and we're grateful to each and every one of you for joining us today. Thank you very much and have a wonderful day.